Dave Calgary, Computer Science CPSC 526, Lecture 19 on the topic of clickjacking, also known as UI redressing. So the idea of clickjacking is that the user interacts with some aspect of the web, a button they're interacting with, and they click on it, and they think that they're clicking on one thing, but actually they're clicking on another. So in this illustration, you see that there is a, a okay, fine, delete my account type of logout screen for Twitter, so closing and deleting your account. And this is, in a sense, what the user is actually clicking on, but what the user actually sees when they visit the website of attacker.com is a big play button for the best game ever. So when they see this, they want to click the play button, and what they don't realize is that play button isn't actually a real button. It's a veneer over top of the Twitter logout screen. And so what the user is actually doing, their click actually goes to Twitter and causes them to delete their account. So the idea of click jacking, it's a portmanteau of click hijacking. The idea is that the attacker overlays multiple transparent or opaque frames over top of an actual legitimate site that tricks a user into clicking a button or link on some other page. And the premise is that it is in violation of the same origin policy. The malicious page cannot click the link itself. It cannot actually cause the link to get clicked. The user is the one who actually has to go and click the uh, delete my account on Twitter button. And the attacking website cannot do that. However, the attacking website can trick the user into clicking that button by making the user think that they're clicking on something else. There's an example of clickjacking in the wild where there was a Facebook worm which superimposed an invisible iframe over the entire page that links to a victim's Facebook page. And then in, if the victim happened to be logged in, then it automatically recommends the link to new friends as soon as it gets clicked on. So when the user is unintentionally clicking on something that recommends that all of their friends click on something and then it spreads virally through the entire Facebook community and hence why it's called a Facebook worm. And of course this made some media attention because uh, it was a, a major initial uh, use of the term clickjacking to uh, start talking about this particular kind of threat as it relates to uh, this Facebook worm. Another example of a clickjack was on Twitter where users sent out tweets against their will. So users would be clicking on something and not realizing it's actually this submit a tweet button and provides the, a message that the attacker has chosen to be outputted onto, uh, out outputted as the recommended or sent out tweets by the users uh, when they click on the fake button. So again, users here are being tricked into clicking on some post to Twitter link. Again, if users are logged in, when these things are clicked on, it's automatically enhanced with the cookies or whatever authenticators are necessary. The same origin policy cannot apply when the user's actually clicking on the button to make things happen. So if you're thinking right now, how, how is this any different from cross-site request forgery? Well, if we remember the cross-site request forgery, we could protect against it by inserting uh, anti-cross-site request forgery tokens, these random numbers that are associated with any form that, when submitted, would cause real-world side effects to occur. However, clickjacking is exactly that working as intended, iframes working as intended. That is, the user goes and clicks the submit button because they want to submit this, this tweet. If the user had actually seen the real thing that they were clicking on, they would see, here's the tweet that they're about to send, here's the submit button that says, yes, send this tweet, and they click on it. The problem is that the Twitter cannot realize that that's not what the user actually saw when they're clicking on it. What the user actually sees when they're clicking on it is what's covering it up, this redressing of the user interface, the thing that's hiding what the user actually is doing and presenting some other button instead. So the user clicks on this other button and ends up submitting to Twitter along with their cookie and whatever anti-cross-site request forgery token is associated with the form 
all of the information to make the request, and Twitter would just assume that that's what the user actually wanted. At this point, we're speaking towards motive, right? Twitter gets all of the information it needs in order to perform the request. What it doesn't know is that that's not what the user actually wanted to do. And it's much harder to speak to what the user's motive is than whether or not all of the information is provided correctly. So in general, a clickjacking attack is when the user's mouse click is used in a way that was not actually intended by the user. So the user is tricked or fooled or in other ways just unaware that when they do an action, that's not the action that they had actually intended to take out. So a simple example of a, of a clickjack attack, here we have an anchor, we have two fields, the href goes to google.com, and then inside that you have the anchor text, so whatever, like go to Google or something. But you see on above, there's the on mouse down, which is a JavaScript event, which means that when you actually put the mouse button down, that JavaScript will then run. And the JavaScript that runs is window.open to evil.com. So why is this a clickjacking attack? Well, when you click down, your mouse down event triggers first, not the mouse up, which happens after, which results in the actual click occurring. And as soon as the mouse goes down, the window switches to evil.com. So the google.com hyperreference is never actually followed. It immediately instead goes to evil.com. So why have the google.com? Well, if you ever use the web browser and you position your mouse over an anchor, it'll tell you where that anchor will resolve to by looking at the hyperreference. So you'll see when you hover over it, oh, it's a safe link. This link goes to google.com. However, when you actually click it, it goes to evil.com. And maybe evil.com is just a giant iframe with google.com and it does some other things that, that it wants to do on that evil website. So the user might even believe that they went to google.com, but really, they're typing in their search queries to evil.com, and then evil.com learns their search queries or something like that. So this is a simple example of a clickjacking attack. So at this point, it's useful to understand the actual mechanics of how clickjacking works and what aspects of the browser permit it to be the case. So let's return to iframes. This is the notion that on the web, any website can frame any other website. And we want to have some security policies, and this is where the same origin policy comes into large effect, where we're allowing ourselves to have these iframes because it's useful from a web browsing standpoint, but we want to ensure that these are treated as separate sessions. And the main frame, the, the main outer website, so to speak, does not need to handle all of the logic of managing two separate windows. In the subframe is its own session. And for instance, if you click a link in the iframe, the iframe goes to a new location. The iframe maintains its own history. Uh, that would be separate from the outer frame. And then what happens is this iframe internally can be just treated as an entirely different browsing session. It just happens to be a smaller window uh, in position within the, the uh, outer frame. There's a few HTML attributes that control how iframes look. So one is the opacity, and this is the percentage that is, that is visible. So if you place the iframe with 1.0, uh, the opacity, that means that it's entirely visible, meaning that it's the only thing you see. Whereas if you put it at zero, it's entirely invisible, meaning that the iframe is loaded, it exists, there's all the links, it's just not being rendered to the screen. So it's there in a sense, its buttons are present, however, you can, the user won't be able to see any of it because it is entirely invisible. And this is just an attribute of these frames. And then what happens is if you stack many iframes on top of each other, you could say have each of them have 10% visibility and you would see a blur of all of them together. So you can just imagine them as being separate windows being put on top of each other, on top of each other, something like transparent slides being placed on top of each other and you can control whether or not it blocks everything underneath it or blocks none of it underneath it or some uh, opacity in the middle. As well, there is a concept of a Z index. So if we think of X and Y as horizontal and vertical, the Z is the depth. 
And this means which position an iframe is on this imaginary stack. So if we have five different iframes all on top of each other, we can position them in a, it basically it's putting one on top of another by controlling their Z index. And the idea of a Z index is that the topmost one gets the click. So when the user puts their mouse over an iframe and clicks down, the topmost one, as indicated by the Z index, is the one that actually receives the user event, that actually processes the code to do the click. And these will be separate browsing sessions, and that one browsing session that is on top is the one that gets the click. Now, you don't necessarily have to restrict that. You can give an iframe a pointer event set to none to say ignore the click which means that the topmost one is the one that can be totally visible, blocking everything underneath it, but then you set the pointer event to none to say, well, don't process any clicks. So it then goes to the next one on the stack. So the Z index tells you which one you see on top, which is the topmost one, and by virtue, which one receives the click, but then you can bypass the clicks and pass the click to the one behind it, and that's the one that gets the actual event. Now we have a case where a particular browser or a particular stack of iframes can have a topmost one, which is totally visible, the others being invisible, while the top one is not the one that actually processes any UI events. And this is exactly the notion of a clickjacking attack. The outermost one is the one that, pr that presents its interface to the user. The one hidden is the one that actually has the consequences of the user's click. The user then clicks, not realizing that they're actually performing events on some other iframe than the one that they're expecting. There's lots of other ways of doing similar sorts of uh, violations of the same origin policy using these UI redressing attacks. Another is known as drag and drop abuse. So for instance, a same origin policy disallows an HTML page to see, for instance, what a user selects in an iframe. So suppose there is a iframe that has a text field within it and the user that stores some information that the, the use that is of interest to the user. Now, the user could select some text in it, but they can't actually use the same origin policy would prevent the outer web page from copying that text that the user selects and using it somehow. That's the idea that the same origin policy disallows reads. And similarly, whatever field, whatever data is actually present in that text box, the outer frame cannot see either. There's no way to obtain the data. If you try to call the text contents of some iframed text field, you would get an exception, a violation of the same origin policy. However, the user can select text and drag it from one text field to another. So if you select text in one browsing session and you drag and drop this text into another text box within the same web page, well, this is a user deliberately circumventing the same origin policy, and it's not considered a security violation. This is the user wanting to do this. If the user wants to select some text that they think is relevant in one paragraph and copy it and save it in somewhere else, that might just be how the user is interacting with this website. So when the user intentionally moves information from one area that is to another area where there is a separation of these two areas based on the same origin policy, when the user intentionally performs this action, it's no longer considered a violation of the same origin policy. It is considered what the user actually wants. However, how could we actually fool the user to do this operation, to basically copy sensitive information from an iframed location into a non-iframed or into a, in another location across the same origin policy. Well, all you have to do is somehow convince the user to click the mouse in certain places and drag this selected text. So select some text and drag it from one place to another. Well, this can be exploited by something like a game where you have to drag and drop some shape. So you have to 
you're presenting the user with exactly what they need to do. Click here, click here, drag from this location, and drop it in that location. And when you are able to do this, then you're able to convince the user to unwittingly violate the same origin policy on themselves. Because while they think that they're playing this game where they're dragging around bananas to monkeys, instead what is occurring is that they're selecting and dragging sensitive information from one iframe to an outer frame and violation of their own best interests and the same origin policy. So the only thing that is needed for an attacker to perform this attack is to just convince the user for any reason to perform a drag and drop operation on their web browser. And there's plenty of ways of doing this with a little game or enticing reward or, or designing a web page that makes it look like this is how you have to do it in order to get whatever you want. So typically the user when presented with this won't be thinking that behind the scenes is some nefarious thing happening. They'll just think that they're interacting with the website that they have every right to assume they are interacting with. A violation of, of course, least uh, of, of least surprise. So the result of this attack is that the user is in fact enlisted in circumventing the same origin policy against their own interests. Another type of uh, an attack in, in this spectrum of UI redressing is known as cursor jacking. So a cursor jacking attack is based on the fact that the mouse cursor can actually be turned off on web browsers. The, the, the property for a CSS cursor's property supports none, which would disable the cursor from appearing. Or you can change its appearance to a different format. And then what you can do is create another cursor in JavaScript that follows, that mimics the mouse movements. And if you have a different looking cursor, it won't implicitly be suspicious. There's websites that do change the appearance of the cursor or have their own cursor just because they want to have their own branding or something like that. So it's not obviously suspicious if your cursor changes. However, it is noticed that if your physics are much different, then users will react strangely and, and find it bizarre. So it's important that the physics sort of map and match the cursor, ex the physics experience that the user was expecting. But here we have an example of this. This was in a, a, you can see, it says in the top left, an experimental site. So this was a, being a, a test being done with actual human participants. And the idea was that there was a skip this ad button that users could click, but actually there was another cursor, their actual cursor was clicking on a, a, a faked install Adobe Flash Player allow or deny type of dialogue that would grant some ex uh, additional permissions to the website that was asking for it. So in this case, the experiment was whether or not users would notice this or whether or not they would actually just think that when they were clicking the skip this ad button with the fake cursor, that they wouldn't notice there was a real cursor about to click allow on a potentially dangerous security warning. Another uh, attack in the spectrum is known as stroke jacking. So with stroke jacking, the, the problem is that, well, on some websites, like a bank, for instance, you might be trying to do a transaction and users are required to enter keystrokes in order to perform that transaction. So for, for instance, imagine a bank or uh, that is making a transfer and you have to actually type out the amount to send and you have to actually type out the account number to send it to. Well, now you're in a situation where you need to somehow get the convince the user to enter in keystrokes. And you can't simply provide your own because that would be in violation of the same origin policy. So you can't provide fake input events across iframes. However, if you can convince the user to enter in strokes, then you can jack those strokes and use them for your own evil purposes. So in this case, the stroke jacking attack is one where the user is presented with some interface where they're trying to enter in some keystrokes in order to continue on some simulated input field, but then the actual keystrokes are being sent to the iframe that needs it. So for instance, enter in the numbers that need to be sent. And so here, a question that were this still in lecture, I would pose uh, what are some ways that the user could be tricked and so I invite you to think about this for a moment, and I'll, I'll give a couple examples now. 
So, for instance, if you are entering in a CAPTCHA, you've seen a CAPTCHA before. Here's an example where you're given numbers and letters to actually just type in. And these could be the numbers that go onto the banking website. Or you could be playing some game as well with a, enter, finding, words in a, finding words in some crossword type of puzzle type thing. And now, again, you're willingly entering in these keystrokes. And it can be controlled such that when the keystroke that's being hit is the one it anticipates it needs, it switches to the actual website, the victim website. And when it's the extra keystroke, so the user real doesn't realize what's actually happening they're not typing in they might type in something meaningful to them that doesn't look like what they're an attack traffic but then the website simply selects the strokes to present to the the victim website as needed so um, there's other ways as well you might think of times you've been browsing the web and just for whatever reason typed in keystrokes well if this was a, a stroke jacking attack any of those strokes could have been jacked by the adversary so, in essence, all of these attacks are conspiring to break the same origin policy. There are, there's some need for human effort to actually click somewhere or type somewhere, and the user is being tricked into clicking or typing in some particular place um, by the attack website. And in general, this is a, a, a invalidation of the security principle of temporal integrity. So it's trying to compromise temporal integrity. And what this means is that the state remains the same in various points in time. So for instance, let's say you wanted to open a file. You might check that you have permission to open the file, and then you open the file. Well, it could be the case that in the time between when you checked and when you actually opened it, you no longer you lost that permission. You no longer have permission to open that file, right? If you if you were thinking back to Kerberos tickets, those Kerberos tickets had a lifetime. You were given permission to access a resource at a particular point in time. Then maybe later you no longer have access because, for instance, you were fired, and now you are trying to gain access. You're not allowed because your ticket has expired. The lifetime on these tickets is a way of achieving this notion of temporal integrity. So you perform a check, and that check has a validity, and it's only valid for a certain amount of time. In the case of clickjacking, it means that the interface that the user is interacting with itself has lost its integrity. The interface has changed between when events are occurring. So for instance, you could, on the on-click event, have some execute, uh, ex as soon as you do a mouse down event, you change the UI so that the actual on click event changes where its target is. Or for instance, you have a website that tries to convince the user to double click. So for whatever reason, it insists that the user double click for some, for some reason, the user then decides they will double click to continue, even though it is a bit unusual on the web to double click on anything. Well, if you get them to double click somehow, after the first click, you swap out the UI and now they're clicking intentionally on a particular spot on the swapped UI after their first click. So in this case, again, this is the notion of temporal integrity that the user decides to do something such as perform a UI operation like a double click and it changes, their interface changes in the middle of this operation, thereby violating the principle of temporal integrity. And for instance, another example would be here with the CAPTCHA, the user decides to start typing in the CAPTCHA. So they enter in the letters. Well, as soon as they enter in the first couple letters, they're presumably going to finish typing the word. If they are able to type um, at a reasonable rate of speed, they'll just type out the word. If they've memorized the word, they'll be able to type the entire thing out. And that means that you can change the UI halfway through the word and the other keystrokes will automatically go to whatever UI element is hidden or is then revealed. So even if you don't allow hidden UI elements to receive any events, you can still perform these violations of temporal integrity where the user interacts with these new, now present, now visible elements at such a high rate of speed that they don't realize that that is the element that they're interacting with. You may have noticed when you try to download a file on a web browser, 
the save button typically takes a few seconds or a few moments before it actually becomes clickable. First you see the dialogue saying save or cancel, but both buttons are grayed out, and then, after a moment, the, they become available. This is actually a defense against clickjacking. The idea being, if you convince the user to, for instance, for some reason, click in a particular location of the screen where this save button will soon appear, you can make the save I item appear immediately, or the run, for instance, uh, even worse, you make the run button execute appear immediately in front of them, and if it's available to be clicked on right away, they'll click it, it'll be dismissed, and they won't even notice that they've done that. Whereas, if you make the dialogue appear and force the user to wait a few moments before they can actually click on it, they'll have a better chance to realize that, wait a minute, this is no longer the whack-a-mole game that I was playing where I was trying to click this mole uh, and thereby advance in levels. And here we have, just as an example, you can convince the user through this game to just click as fast as possible all over the screen and whenever you want, switch it, switch the UI elements to another one, such as the Facebook like button, and then they'll start liking things accidentally. All of this in violation of the same origin policy, because the user is being tricked into violating it themselves. So here are lots of choices available to the adversary. The question now is, how do we stop this? How can we support the users to make better decisions? Well, one, we could have user confirmation of events. So when good sites pop up with a dialog box, it contains info, warns the user about what it's going to do, asks them to confirm, as maybe, again, as mentioned, makes them wait a few moments so they actually realize that they're interacting with this UI element, this new UI element, and they're not accidentally just clicking somewhere randomly. Unfortunately, these things tend to lead themselves to awful user experiences. You know, error warnings are not generally that helpful. Users try to dismiss them or continue using or continue doing what they were doing before, and so they're not. It's not a very reliable way of of dealing with this problem. We want the users to have a good usable experience on the web, not dealing with warning messages all of the time. Another idea that was proposed was UI randomization. And the idea here is that you can perform these clickjacking attacks because you know where on the screen this this Facebook will render this button or where the bank will render this button. You know where the user needs to click in order to continue. So you could have a good site, like a bank, embed their form elements at random locations so that you don't know exactly where it's going to appear. So the account to enter appears on this part of the screen and the amount to send appears on another part and it's random every time. Again, this is a, a terrible, terrible user experience. This would be just miserable. Typically, you want things to be familiar so that users don't make mistakes and not cha changing the user ex interface all of the time. And as well, it's not foolproof. You can simply just have the user click randomly as well, have them click over different parts of the screen, and the button is going to be big enough that you won't have to click every single pixel, but just in a bunch of different locations, and eventually the user will click it. Another solution is to make use of what's known as an opaque policy. The idea is you just disallow this transparent element. You disallow this idea that some UI elements are allowed to not be visible and at the same time receive input events from the user because this seems pretty prone to these sorts of attacks. That is, now each pixel of the screen belongs to a single element, and that element has to be visible to the user. The user must be able to see the pixel that they're clicking on, and only if the user sees that pixel are input events allowed to be delivered to the, anything owned by that pixel. So there's a problem here that's actually worth thinking about as well, so I encourage you to pause as well and, and think about exactly what can go wrong with just this opaque policy, because the answer I will reveal now is that you can have overlaps or cropping. You can selectively remove things. So the idea here is that instead of not, uh, you still show the submit button, you still show the send button, but you just hide what it's actually doing. So now the send button belongs to the bank, but the rest of the screen doesn't. 
and the rest of the screen hides the fact that you're about to send some money to some, someone else. Or it, it, you, the Twitter submit button is still there, but the message you're going to submit isn't. Right, so it's not a, a perfect solution in this regard because all of the contextual information behind what that button will do when the user hits it has to also be available to the user. And that is typically not as easy to represent as a simple policy such as the UI element that whose pixels are visible or is eligible to receive uh, events from the, from the user. And this brings us to the best solution that we have to deal with the problem of UI redressing and other than click style, click tracking style of attacks, and that's known as frame busting. So the idea of frame busting is that I, as the page owner, the the, the website that is providing the page, the the bank, for instance, I decide whether or not I allow that I go into an iframe. So in another website evil.com tries to put my good website, bank.com, into an iframe, I just refuse it. I disallow it as a matter of policy, state that I am never to be loaded into an iframe, and therefore this entire space of attacks becomes infeasible, because I am never going to be in an iframe, and there's really no legitimate reason for, for instance, your banking website to be iframed by another website. It's it's There's not a really compelling reason to support this functionality, so it's better to just say, don't put me in an iframe, full stop. And in JavaScript, you could express this code in this sort of following way. So top refers to the top of the document, self is the current element, and you can just say, if, I, if I'm if i not equal to the top of the, web, of the web hierarchy, then set the location of the outer frame, the top, set its href to my href. This is the JavaScript equivalent of frame busting is basically just saying, if I'm not equal to the outermost web page, then make the outermost web page equal to me. So the general idea is that frame busting consists of a conditional check. You first check to see if you are iframed, if top is not equal to self, and then you take some counter action if it's detected, such as setting top equal to self. And then you won't be iframed. There's no more click checking. It doesn't work for everything. For instance, if you want intentionally want things embedded like the Facebook like button, stuff like that, as not being a full website, but really an iframed element that allows you to click on it and interact with some third party, it won't work. But, you know, oh, well, at least it works for the main problem, which is having secure websites that have strong consequences and making sure that they're not getting iframed. So, clickjacking is solved. Outstanding. Unfortunately, there was a research study by some, some researchers, security researchers, who looked at the Alexa top 500 websites, so a list of the top 500 websites, as well as all, US, all top US banks. They found that of them, only 14% used frame busting. And of those 14% of these websites that used frame busting, 100% of them were able to be circumvented, meaning that all of their techniques to do frame busting failed. Some were browser specific that only worked on Internet Explorer or something like that. Others worked across browsers, but in general, there was no, this was not being implemented correctly in the wild. The main reason why is because they wanted to allow their own iframes of themselves when it's coming from them, but just not be iframed by other websites. So it's not the case that they wanted, that they were okay with iframing. Um, they, they, it's, they wanted to allow iframes to exist, just not for other people to actually perform those iframes on their behalf, only for them. And so they have code to check to see if it's them, and if it's them, allow it, and if it's not them, then don't allow it. And this was where there was a major source of bugs. M the main reason these were failing in practice was because of this code, which is not easy to express in a policy. That is, I don't want to be an iframe, but I'm okay with other things, being an iframe to my own web page and stuff like that. It's not easily written up into a policy uh, that can be implemented so we'll look at a few examples of how this was incorrectly done. So Walmart had a frame-busting technique. Theirs was 
an effect looked as follows. So if the top location is not equal to my location, so if the top, if they are in a, in a sense being iframed, then they would check to see if the documents refer matched walmart.com. So here what they're doing is checking to see if document.refer exists as an object, and then if it does, calling the index of walmart.com, which returns minus one if it's not found, and returns the string offset zero through to the length of the string, where it finds the substring walmart.com. And if it doesn't find walmart.com, or there is no refer to speak of, then it replaces the document it replaces the top with the document's hyperreference, meaning that it implements the frame busting technique. It sets the location for the outer website to be equal to the location of the inner website. So where can this go wrong? So you can pause and think about it, right? But we're basically just doing a string search, meaning that if you set the refer to be attacker.com slash walmart.com.html, then this string search will succeed, even though it's not actually checking the, 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 or implementing the check correctly. The idea of the walmart.com was that it was actually the domain, the host name, but it was implemented as anywhere appearing in the URL at all, which is incorrect. And as a result, this would be able to circumvent that frame busting technique. The New York Times had a frame busting technique where here they were again doing a string match. They had a regular expression. They were matching HTTP with a possible S colon slash slash something dot New York Times dot com. And if that matched, then they would do the frame busting. So here it looks a little bit better, but it's still not actually using the real context of what the host name actually is. It is still doing a string comparison, searching for a substring, except now they've included HTTPS colon slash slash in it. Well, it turns out you can include that if you want as well. So eve.com slash a dot HTML question mark B equals HTTPS colon slash slash blah, blah, blah. So Again, string comparison does not have the full contextual information of what is trying to be implemented here, which is that you're trying to check whether or not the host name matches newyorktimes.com, not whether a particular string appears within another string. US Bank had a frame busting technique where if self was not equal to top, it would call a get domain function. So it actually did the get domain function correctly. So it was able to, it, impl it, it got that contextual information from the domain. So now it's actually holding the actual domain. Then it had a list of these okay domains. So US Bank, local host, and USB net, these were okay domains. And if one of those three were in the domain, then it, was, it wouldn't frame bust. And if it didn't, if the domain didn't include one of these three, then it would frame bust. So what can go wrong here? Well, again, we are still doing just a string comparison, except now we're doing a string comparison on the actual domain. So we're a little bit better off, but it's still not perfect because uh, usbank.attacker.com, which an attacker could easily set up, it would also pass this check. The Norwegian Statehouse Bank, whose bank and, dot, and O would also pass this check because it contains US Bank as a substring. The Bank of Moscow, rustbank.org would pass because it contains US Bank as a substring. So again, it's searching in the right place this time, but it's still just doing a string search instead of actually making sure the two domains are the same, that it is the domain it's actually thinking of as opposed to just one, the domain containing another substring. Another problem was that they found the typical frame busting code worked as follows. They would say if the parent's location is not equal to my location, so if there if there's an outer page that is having a URL that is different than the iframed URL, which you're trying to bust out of, then set the parent to be equal to the current. So in this case, we would frame bust out of the out of the element the iframe that we're in and replace the parent with ourselves. Unfortunately, you could do here a double framing attack. So now the main frame has the 
uh, iframe containing some secondary frame, which serves no other purpose than being the parent to victim.com. So when victim.com attempts to frame bust, it frame busts out of the iframe within main, the mainframe, but not actually altogether out of the attacker's website. So in this case, they're inside a frame inside a frame, they frame bust out one level, but they're still within a frame. So this was suggested to be the fix that you should always use the top location instead of the parent location. So if the top location is not equal to the to self location, then top location equals self location. So now we're avoiding the double framing attack. However, there's still a problem here in some browsers. You can clobber the meaning of the word location. So in Internet Explorer, you can create a variable called location, and now setting it will change that and not actually the location of the uh, of the iframe or, or of the parent frame. In Safari, you can create these a setter called location, which is a function that does nothing. So again, we're dealing with the fact that these dynamic languages, this JavaScript dynamic language, doesn't guarantee that when you try to set the location, it actually affects the variable that you're thinking of. And in these two cases, that the meaning of that could be clobbered. So again, this is now browser specific, but still guarantees that this is not this is not the the the, the solution that we need to solve the frame busting problem. Another thing that uh, could be done is to create a pop-up that appears when a frame busting is attempted to be done. And in this case, the user maybe thinks that they're on PayPal, but actually they're on an iframed version of PayPal. PayPal tries to do frame busting, but then when the outer page is unloaded, it triggers an alert saying, "Would you? are you sure you want to navigate away from this? And if the user here clicks cancel, they will abort the frame busting. So what's happening is frame busting is attempted to be done by PayPal. The outer website has a script that runs on, when it's being unloaded, which prints the message, do you want to leave PayPal? Even though that's not a sincere message because you're actually leaving the attacker's website, but the attacker can put whatever string they want to put there. And then when the user who thinks, no, I don't want to leave PayPal, I just got here, I'm trying to do stuff on PayPal, why uh, uh, cancel? then what ends up happening is frame busting doesn't happen and PayPal would just not notice. It would just assume that it had passed correctly. So in this case, the user accidentally cancels frame busting when they click that cancel button instead of actually leaving PayPal, which is what that warning message in a sense threatened would happen to the user. And it's implemented by actually the iframers on before unload function and not part of PayPal. So the attacker can just put the warning in there. When frame bu busting happens, the user is enlisted to cancel it against their own best interest. So the best approach for now is to style the HTML body as display colon none, so just nothing appears. Then you attempt to frame bust if you find that self is not equal to top. So check to see if you are iframed in at any depth. And if you are, try to frame bust. Then check. Make sure that you actually succeeded in frame busting. And if you did succeed in frame busting, then you can change the display to block so that it actually then appears and renders. And if you do not succeed in frame busting, then you don't show the page to the user at all. Going forwards, though, however, there's better approaches if we use the browser to implement them, because in a sense, the browser knows where the refers are, it knows the domains, it knows where or what the levels of iframing are that are occurring. And we don't need to rely on ad hoc string search and string substring searches to search for domain names within a, within a URL, we can actually just use the browser to implement the policy correctly. And the policy that we actually want is that first, deny all iframing, or second, to allow iframes only if it's in from the same origin. Here, we're using the same origin policy and saying, well, I'm willing to be iframed from the same origin, or I'm not willing to be iframed at all. So 
These are optional HTTP headers, the x-frame-options header with the possible values deny and same origin. Deny means that the browser is not to render the thing at all if it is in an iframe. Same origin means that the page will only be rendered if the top, the outermost frame, has the same origin as the thing doing the iframing. And it's well supported in the moment with the browsers, not yet widely used by websites, but uh, hopefully that will change.